Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name is Edie, and I'm grateful to know I'm an alcoholic. It's really funny you introduced me that way because all people ask me, how are you doing today? I said, not bad for an old broad, so, you know, I guess I got it back this time. I introduced myself as grateful to know I'm an alcoholic because when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, I didn't know I was an alcoholic. California Highway Patrol knew I was an alcoholic. My kids knew I was an alcoholic. Felony Judge Rosenfield knew I was an alcoholic, but I didn't know I was an alcoholic. And I got in here and I looked at those steps, and those steps said something about restored to sanity, and I had a problem with that. I wasn't insane either. Um, so I didn't need to be restored to sanity, and I didn't have a problem with alcohol. I had a problem with you. And if you would just leave me alone, then I would be okay. And they wouldn't leave me alone. And, 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 and I, I couldn't figure out why, if I could just get better at what I was doing or sneaking or how I was doing it. Um, I've been to a lot of meetings in my life, and a lot of times I've heard people say that they don't want to hear drunkologues from up here, and they go out of their meetings grousing about, oh, well, they just did a drunkologue up there. Well, I'm going to tell you I'm going to do a drunkologue tonight, all right, y'all? So if you don't like it, you need to get a sponsor and get with them. And, re- and vent your resentment with your sponsor, because they'll tell you what to do with it. They'll tell you how to handle that. And then, for those of you that aren't going to do that, I dare you to hear the steps in my, in my story, because you will hear them. They are there. You might have to dig a little bit, but you will find the process of the steps in my story. So, where it started, let's see. I had this boyfriend. <laughs> <laughs> And he told me that in 30 days, he was moving out from my house to move in with some other girl. But he's going to wait 30 days because her old man wasn't moving out, so he was waiting to move out. <laughs> my inability to live life didn't know how to deal with that. And so I thought, well, you know, I know what I can do. So I walked down to my neighborhood bar. Now... I used to think it was really cool when you walked into a bar and everybody knew your name, like on Cheers. You know, that's a, think about that. That's not really all that cool. But it is if they know what you drink and how you drink it and, and everything else. You don't have to order. You don't have to talk so much. Or you can talk about other things, whatever. Um, and so I walked in and the bartender went to sit up my drinks, my black tonic with a squeeze, ice water back, and a straw, please. And that's what I had every single time. I said, no, that's not what I want. He said, well, what do you want? And I said, hmm, I think I want a shot at tequila. <laughs> and he said, oh, you don't drink that. I said, I am tonight. And he said, okay. <laughs> so he pulled out a shot glass, and you know, this thing was really little. And he started to pour. I said, no, I need more than that. So he got out a rock glass, and he filled up the rock glass. And, and um, about, I don't know, 20 of those later, I decided it was time to go home. Now, I'm going to tell you, it wasn't until I got into Alcoholics Anonymous that I heard about blackouts, because I never blacked out. And I'll tell you, when I did my fourth step, I had a lot of resentments to y'all that blacked out, because you got to leave big holes. I had to remember all that stuff and write it all down, and you guys got to leave it out. But I got in my car, and I drove the three blocks home, and got home safely, and passed out. Not blacked out, but I passed out. And about four hours later, my mom called on the phone, and I got on the phone and talked to her for a little bit, and when I got off the phone, I was bored. And in my town, at that time, there was about 2,500 people. There was nothing to do at 11 o'clock at night. So I got in my car and drove back downtown, the three blocks back downtown, and walked in and ordered, well, what I said in court was a couple more. Um, and I've learned since that alcoholics always drink more than two and call it a couple. Um, and so I had 
a couple more, which I actually did. I had two more tequilas. And I got in my car and I drove home again. And this time some guy in a 240Z passed me over a solid yellow line within 100 yards of an inter intersection, exceeding the speed limit. I was turning left, had my <coughs> hand out, blinker on, and I hit it. And he was mad. So I drove up my driveway. He followed me up my driveway screaming and yelling and hollering at me. And um, I went and called the police. <laughs> See? I'm not insane. But I, I called the police and y'all are laughing. I just, I was, I had that right indignation. And I called him and told him this guy was out there yelling at me and, and what he'd done. And they asked me if I step out of the house. And I said, sure, I'll step out of the house. I have no problem doing that. So I walked out of the house, and I went down the driveway with them, and I told them, you know, he did this and he did that. And they said, fine, if you had anything to drink. I said, of course I've had something to drink. But what does that make any difference? Look at what he did. And they said, uh, well, that's fine. Um, how about you come down to the police station with us and we'll do a little bit more for your our accident report here. And I said, okay. I said, am I under arrest? They said, no, we just need more information. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, okay, <laughs> I'll go with you. So now, see, I think I got power too, right? Right, okay. So I jump in the front of the police car and I go down there and they do some more stuff. And then they said, well, we need some more information. Would you like to do a breath of blood or a, a urine? For, for a, and I said, well, doesn't it take like 30 days to get back a, a blood and a urine? They said, yeah. I said, do we get to know what the blood breath is right now? He said, said, yeah. I said, okay, I'll do that. <laughs> and they said, well, well, we don't have a breath machine here. They said, so we have to take you down to the next city to do a breath test. I said, okay. So I jump in the front of the police car and I'm playing with a radio and <laughs> going down the road. And, and as we get down the road, um, they do a breath test. And I think I blew. The, well, the first time I blew, I went, I don't know if y'all and if y'all can do a breath test, but that doesn't work. They won't let you do that. So I did that, and that didn't work, and they wouldn't let me do it. So they told me I had to blow really hard on this thing. And I think I blew like a 2-4 or something like that, a point two four. And to their word, they put me back in the car and took me home and dropped me off in my house. They said they didn't, they weren't arresting me, and they, and they did it. But they <laughs> put me in my house with the express instructions that I was not to drive. And I, so I promised them I wouldn't drive, um, except I didn't know where my cigarettes were, and I needed some cigarettes. <laughs> <laughs> so I was going to wait 15 minutes and go down to the shortstop a mile down the road after they left. Well, I've since found out that there's a lot of police officers that are in these rooms, and there's a lot of police officers that aren't in these rooms that deal with us the kids in these rooms and don't get in these rooms, and they know that we wait 15 minutes. <laughs> so they can go do whatever they want to and show back up in 15 minutes. I don't know. When I walked in my house, though, my cigarettes were there, so I didn't have to, even though I promised. Now, I, I would always tell you I was truthful to it, you know, but I promised them I wouldn't drive. Well, it turns out that what happened in that is, is that the police did not arrest me, but the district attorney saw point two four and decided to press charges. So I got hauled into court um, on a DUI, and when I went to court, I was really, really angry because the guy that I hit was an off-duty police officer who had no insurance on his car and had also been drinking, but they did nothing with him. So that just fueled the resentment that I had. I ended up in a jury trial. We ended up with a jury. Um, I ended up with a hung jury, 11 to 1 for acquittal. And you know, it was that little 7th Avenue lady that was sitting on that jury that hung me up because, you know, 7th Avenue don't drink. And so it must have been her that hung me up on that jury. They decided that... Uh, the judge decided he was going to try to, he was going to retry the case, um, and they talked him into giving me a wet record, which meant nothing at that time except until, unless you got another DUI, and I wasn't going to get another DUI. So I went about my merry way for the next four years. I became a bartender. Um, 
I, I did a lot of other things in my life, and, and, and as a bartender, what I did is I had, I lived like real close to three counties, and so I lived in Napa Lake and Sonoma County, and so I had a home bar in Sonoma County, and I had a home bar in Napa County, and I had a home bar in Lake County, and I was a mobile drunk. And everywhere I went, I always had drinks with me, and I always carried my bottle of vodka in the back in my 32 to 48 ounce glass. I was going to invent one of those something to go between your legs but that doesn't get so cold when you hold it. I never got around to doing that because <laughs> my legs would get really cold from the cold the, the vodka tonics that I carry with me. Um, I was on my way home from my home bar, and I went around the corner, and the tires on the tire, front tire on my car blew. Now, this was Pirelli's fault, because these were brand new Pirelli's on a Datsun E210 or something, some crazy drunk car that, that, that you know, I, I, I don't, that it is, it's all it is, I, it can't be anything but a drunk car. And... And so as I turned the corner, the tire went out, and I hit the center section that they had just put in, and it hadn't been there before. I did a 360 and a 180 and came back the other direction, heading the other direction, and pulled into a, a gas station. And I got out of the car to go to a phone booth. And, you know, as I tell this story, I keep realizing that most people don't even know what a phone booth is anymore. There aren't such things. But I went to a phone booth to call somebody to come get me because you see, I know how to change a tire on my car, but I fancy myself an environmentalist. And I worked in a bar, I told you. So I said, call the bottles from the bar and, and had them in the back of this car. And, and I was going to recycle them. But I also had them back there for another reason because I knew if the police walked up, they can smell alcohol. But if I had that in the back, they get the alcohol from the smell of all those bottles up there and, and smell all those bottles so they wouldn't smell me. And if they wanted to get me for open, they couldn't get me for open container because I had a hundred bottles in there. And then so, so there's no such thing as an open container, right? So I had all this, but I couldn't get to my fair care because I had all these bottles. So I called this drunk that lived at my house and I asked him to come over and help me offload these bottles to get them out of my car to change my tire. And he yelled at me, and so I hung up the phone on him. <laughs> that got me a lot of places. Turned around the phone, I go out of the phone booth, and there was a cop. And he said, I'm arresting you. I said, for what? He said, for DUI. And I'm not driving this phone booth anywhere. <laughs> he said, no, but you were driving that car over there. I said, you didn't see me. You can't arrest me. He said, but the gas station attendant saw you drive in it. And he said, and here in Sonoma County, if you get a DUI and are successfully prosecuted and are reported, that person gets $100. Oh. Resentment. <laughs> and I said, okay, well... Whatever he says, well, let's do a, let's do a field sobriety test. So he puts me through the field sobriety test, and I pass. And he looked at me, and he says, "This thing." Now, this thing I think tells within point zero zero three, up to a blood alcohol of point three two. What the blood alcohol is? And he was doing this, and he said. Well, lady, you passed the field sobriety test. I said, I know. Can I go? He said, nope. He said, because this thing says that you're very drunk. And I said, well, I just did you know what you told me to do. He said, no, come on. We're going to jail. So he took me into jail, and he said, okay, we'll do a breath of blood in the urine. Well, I knew that the breath got instant results, so I did a breath test. And he had me blow on this thing, but instead of just three times like I'd done before, he had me blow 11 and 12 times, and, then, and I looked down to see why. And I was blowing 3, 8, 3, 9, 3, 8, 3, 9, 3, 9, 3, 9. He said, lady, you're supposed to be dead. I said, I'm not. Can I go? <laughs> <laughs> he said, yeah, you're going into the rubber room. So I spent the night in the rubber room. Because I guess they thought I was going to be doing the tuna or something that night. And, 
And when I got out, you know, I was yelling at him, what do you think I'm going to do? Hang myself with some toilet paper? Bring me some toilet paper in here. And I kept, don't you know I'm supposed, you're supposed to be checking on me every 15 minutes to see I've been a correctional officer, too. So I knew, I knew what their job was, and I was telling them what their job was. Um, they finally let me down about 6 o'clock in the morning to make a phone call, and I called that drunk that I called before, and I said, see what you did to me? See where you put me? You know, I've been in jail all night now, and they, and they don't know who I am, and they're making me bail out of here. They're not ORing me out of jail, and they're making me pay $1,000 to get out of jail. So you bring me $1,000, and you get over here, and you pick me up. And so he showed up about quarter to seven in the morning with my $1,000 and bailed me out of jail. And uh, as soon as I walked out, I thought, where's my car? It's just like car to car jail. And car jail didn't open until 9 o'clock. And it's 7 o'clock in the morning. And my home bar was right across the street. And my home bar happy hour was from 7 to 8 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> and if you could prove you just got out of jail, because that's when they usually release people, you could get a free shot of whatever you wanted. <laughs> so off I went to my home bar, and if I ever dipped below a three, I was right back up there before I went and picked up my car. Because what I realized as I went through these steps is, you know, there's no human power can restore me to sanity. And, you know, that's what judges were trying to do. That's what the cops were trying to do. They were trying to restore me to sanity. They didn't have the needed power. They were doing it by locking me up taking away my car, taking away my license. They were trying to do some sort of restoration of sanity, and it just wasn't happening. But I wasn't insane. You know, that just wasn't me. So after I got out of there, I decided that, well, actually, they decided that I needed to go to some kind of drunk driving school. And I already told them I knew how to drive drunk, and that wasn't the point of drunk driving school. It was how to not drive drunk, I guess, or how not to get caught. I'm not really sure what it was, but I went to go sign up for it, and they told me not to drink for 24 hours before I came to sign up for it. And so I bartended, <laughs> bartended that night, and I went the next day. And, and when I got in there, they did the process, and afterwards they said, Hey, we told you not to drink for 24 hours. I said, I didn't drink for 24 hours. And they said, Well, let's see. And they stuck this little stick in my mouth. And that stick within 30 seconds measured a point one, and that's all the farther the stick went, was to a point one. And um, they said, well, we're not signing you up for this class, and we're turning you into probation because you, put, you, you, you came here under the influence. And I said, but I didn't drink for 24 hours. So we don't care. You're under the influence. So they turned me back into probation. I went into probation, and probation said, you know terms of your probation are you not to drink? I said, no, I didn't know that. <laughs> and he said, well, it is. And he said, uh, how long has it been since you had a drink? <laughs> and I said, <laughs> I said, 24 hours from before they told me. He said, let's see. And he stuck a stick in my mouth. And it registered up to almost to a point one then. He says, well, it looks like we've got two violations of probation here. And he says, here in Sonoma County, we give you 60 days for violation of probation. He says, and we've got two violations of probation, and so we've got 120 days. I think you've got a problem with alcohol. I said, I don't have a problem with alcohol. He said, well, then I guess we'll have to put you in jail for 120 days unless you want to go to treatment. I said, i got a problem with alcohol. <laughs> so off I went to treatment. I don't know what, I don't have a clock. Right Straight out on the wall. Oh, straight out on the wall. What, what time am I supposed to stop with? <laughs> okay. Anyway, so um, I went to treatment. And what I decided to do is I was going to go to treatment as undercover. Because what I was going to do is I was going to become a psychologist and I was going to hang out a shingle. And so, and then I would specialize in alcohol and drug addiction. And so what I do is I go through rehab because then if you went to rehab, you'd know when you're sending people there what they'd be experiencing, and you could tell them. So I was going in as undercover to find out what they taught and what they did in rehab. <laughs> so what I didn't realize is I was going to a 28-day rehab, but the 28 days didn't start until they said it started. And it didn't start, and they didn't say it started until you started cooperating with them. So 45 days later, I got out of my 28-day rehab. <laughs> And, but I learned some stuff in that rehab. 
And what I learned in that rehab is one of those things is alcoholics always had more than two drinks and called it a couple. That was one thing I learned. I learned that alcoholics never planned on getting drunk. They just did. And I learned that alcoholics never left a drink. That, that whenever they went someplace, they not only drank their drink, but lots of times they go around and drink other people's drinks. And that's what I learned in rehab. So I came back to my bar job, and um, I went to a meeting. And I, when I went to this meeting, they went around the room and introduced themselves. You know, my name is Sally, and I'm an alcoholic from Woodland Hills. Or my name is Judy, I'm an alcoholic from Calistoga. And they got to me, I'm not saying anybody. And this guy next to me says, I'm not saying nothing. He says, well, we can't go on unless you say, don't say something. Says, but I'm not saying anything. And he says, we've got to say something. Uh, I'm eating and I'm here because the fucking judge sent me. <laughs> Keep coming back. <laughs> and I said, oh, my goodness. But the reason I went to that meeting is because I had to go back to court and I had to have four, they gave me four months to get four meetings and I had to go to court the next day. And so I had to get in like four meetings. I hadn't been to any. And so after I went to that meeting, I, I went out to some meetings out at Duffy's in, in my town. And there was this, and, and I went and I sat in this group, these groups, and they said they'd sign off my four meetings and, and, uh, Gene Duffy was there leading one of the groups, and he said, you know, I was in a meeting last night, and there was this woman there, and she wouldn't say she's an alcoholic. He said, good for her, because she doesn't know she's an alcoholic, or if she is or she isn't, and he said, and you know what, you guys sitting in here, a lot of you don't know whether or not you're alcoholic. He says, and I give that woman credit, he says, and if you don't know that you're an alcoholic, he says, you step into Susie. He says, you go in that bar and you try some controlled drinking, and if you can do that, my hat's off to you. Now, see, I had no idea that came directly out of the book. And Susie's was my bar, so he just told me to go drink. That's what I thought. The guru of Alcoholics Anonymous has given me permission to go drink. And after all I've learned about alcoholics, that's what I'm going to do. So I went in, I ordered a drink, and had one drink, ordered the second drink, and drank half of it. I didn't get drunk. I'm leaving part of the drink. I'm not finishing it, see? And it's less than a couple. And I got up and walked out. Yeah, pretty good. And then the next day, and I did the same thing. I did that for a little bit, and then all of a sudden I said, you know what? That last drink there, that drink cost me $2.25. <laughs> And ain't nobody here saying, oh, good, Edie, look, you left part of a drink. Even the bartender didn't say I left part of a drink on the table. You know, if I drink it down real quick and I hold my hands around it, the ice will melt. It'll look like I left half a drink on the bar. <laughs> so I did. And then I planned on getting drunk because y'all never planned on getting drunk. You just did. So I planned on getting drunk. Come on, Friday night, I'm partying. Let's go. Well, that lasted for a little while. I did drink. I had times of drinking. I had times of not drinking. And I was just after a time of not drinking for a little bit. And I went down to this bar, and I sat in the bar all day long drinking Coke. And about 1.25, I decided that I wanted to drink. Now, again, remember, I'm not insane. 1.25 in the morning, I decided to drink. So I sat there, and within the next few minutes, I had like eight shots of rumplement, and then I re realized that I had eight miles I had to drive home, but my my car was my problem, so I asked this guy sitting next to me, if he, <laughs> he was already drunk, if he, could, if he would drive my car, and he told me he would. And so I said, okay, so I had two more drinks, and then I went out to my car that had been sitting in the alley all day long behind the bar. Um, because I didn't trust him to start my car. Now, he's going to drive my car. I went out to start my car, and I was arrested for the UN in the bridge. 
This time I knew what worked last time, so I ran to rehab. This time when I got out of rehab, I figured, you know, maybe there's something to this. Maybe there really is something to this. Maybe I should get on the ball here. Maybe I should do something. So I got out of rehab. And what I heard this time was what I needed to do was 90 meetings in 90 days. I heard I needed to get a sponsor. I needed to do what the sponsor told me to do. And I needed to get into service. Because I heard people that were standing up here talking to people saying that they relapsed. And when they relapsed, they looked back and they saw that they had cut back on their meetings, they cut back on their sponsors, and they cut back on service. And so that told me and this great brain of mine that that's what I needed to do in order to stay sober. So within the next six and a half months, I didn't do 90 meetings in 90 days. I did over 500 meetings in six and a half months. I got the papers to prove it. Um, I got a sponsor. She had me writing on a first step. I heard other people talking about first steps and what was going on. I wasn't feeling any different, but I was doing what she told me. I got some good information from that woman. Um, and I was in service to every single meeting I went to. What happened is I went to a friend's house afterwards that I'd been to many, many, many times in my sobriety. And as I walked into the house, um, we were sitting there, we were watching HBO, and, and he said to me, he said, Edie, would you like a drink? And I said, yes, and I always said yes. And he said, okay, well, you know where it is, go get yourself a drink. And so, usually I went out and I got down a glass and I poured myself an iced tea. And what I did is this time I got down that same 32-ounce glass and I filled it with ice. And I remember in his refrigerator, there was a gallon of milk, there was a half gallon of orange juice, there was a bottle of vodka, there was a bottle of gin, there was... 12 Pepsi or 12 Cokes in this refrigerator. And what I did is I poured myself a 32 ounce vodka and orange juice. And I went back out and I sat down on the couch and we were watching Roseanne. That's how, that's what it was. And I drank this drink and I was halfway through drinking that drink before I realized I was drinking alcohol. I did have no intention of drinking. I didn't do that to spit it out. I hadn't had a drink in six and a half months and I sat there and just drank drank it down, and then I looked at it and said, oh my God, I'm drinking. And you know, I didn't know why I was drinking. I had no idea why. Since I've been in the program and gone through that book of Alcoholics Anonymous, I read a little passage in there and it said something about blank, strange mental blank spots. And that's what happened to me. I was in one of those strange mental blank spots. I didn't know what it was. I'd never read about it. I'd never heard about it. But I had no defense. I had no defense. I didn't know that. I had no clue. Because I was going to meetings. I had a sponsor. I was doing all that stuff. And here I am drinking. Now, halfway through that drink, and the first thought in my mind was, when I go to a meeting tomorrow, not if, when I go to a meeting tomorrow, am I going to introduce myself as a newcomer? Well, I don't know. They tell me one day at a time, so I don't have to make that decision now. <laughs> but if I am, I might as well finish this damn thing. <laughs> as well, as I've already drank half of it, so I drank that, and I went in and poured myself another 32-ounce vodka and orange juice and drank a second one. And then the guy looks at me and says, e, you know, i got to get up and go to work in the morning. i got to go to bed. He says, so you're welcome to stay here or... You know, you can do whatever you want to. And I said, well, I need a clean shirt for work in the morning. Now I'm at a guy's house that's full of clean shirts. He lives about five blocks from my work. But I get in my car because the next stop is my mind is I miss my home bar. So I drive over the hill to my home bar, and I walk in my home bar at about 1.15 in the morning. And I said, hmm. Well, I'll shake you for a drink. And the bartender said, okay. So I won, and I got a drink, and he shook me again, and he won, and I bought his drink, and there was a drunk sitting there that told me he was going to be out sleeping in the Goodwill box out there. So I told him, well, if you drive me home, because the car's my problem, <laughs> if you drive me home, I'll tell you what, you sleep on my couch, I'll bring you back in the morning uh, when I come back to work. And he said, okay. Next thing I know, it was 7.15 in the morning, my new car was smashed up against the tree. Um, I was on the ground with head injuries and chest injuries. The driver was gone in California Highway Patrol was putting handcuffs on me, taking me to jail for felony DUI. 
And I tell you, I never took step one. Step one took me into Sonoma County Jail. I got in there and I didn't know why I was there. I really didn't know why I was there. And people around me would say, well, you were told if you ever drank again, you were going to go to jail because I was looking at three to four years in prison. They said, that's what's going to happen to you. You're going to go to prison if you drank again. But you see, I didn't know why I drank again. Because I did what I heard that you were supposed to do, not to drink. What I'm going to tell you right now is those are all good parts of sobriety, and it's wonderful, it enhances your sobriety, but that's not going to keep you sober. I'm proof of that. Those are wonderful. Get a sponsor. You know, do what your sponsor tells you. Get in the service. Go to you. That's not going to keep you sober. It's not. I'm proof. I know it. Tonight, I have given you no opinion, I have given you no theories, and I have given you no beliefs. Because those are only figments of my imagination. <laughs> All I've shared with you is my experience. And my, you can't argue with my experience. My experience says that that's not going to be supposed. So I, step one took me in Sonoma County Jail. I didn't know why I was there. I had no clue. I all of a sudden got it. I had no power over that stuff that I bought, that I poured, that I drank. I had no power over that. And I needed to do something. I got out of jail, and through what I call a series of miracles, and I'm really, really particular about miracles. Miracles aren't something that you get a good public pretender on, or you hire, you know, somebody that's good or whatever. It, and it's a long story, but through a series of miracles, I walked out time served five months. Um, and I haven't found it necessary to have a drink since. I got out and I got busy and I found some people that took me through that book of Alcoholics Anonymous and we actually started in the back of the book at the spiritual experience because they said that's where alcoholics start is at the back of the book. Always want to know the end first. So we started at the back and then we went through the front, through the front of the book and we did page by page by page. I was told step one does not come until page 30 of that book of Alcoholics Anonymous. There's 60 pages before page 30. So I, by jumping right into step one, I had no clue. What I found out is that I truly was an alcoholic. That was called the investigation to find out if, in fact, I was an alcoholic those first 60 pages. If I was, then there's things I have to do. If I'm not, then there's things I don't know. It, 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 there's a, there's a, there's an algebraic equation. The amount that I've lost the ability to choose whether or not I drink is in direct proportion to the amount that I need some kind of spiritual help. That's really, that I'm paraphrasing all over the place, but that's what it says. That's basically what it says. And that's real simple. That's, that's real simple. That's a, like a mathematical equation. And I found out that I totally lost the ability to control my drinking. And that because of that, and because I had nothing else to back me up, I had strange mental blank spots. You know, I'm getting old, and I can pretend like I have mental blank spots nowadays, <laughs> but they're not the same kind of mental blank spots that I had when I drank. I hadn't found it necessary to pick up a drink. What I found is I found some wonderful friendships. I'm here, I'm getting ready to leave in a few hours to, get up, to go fly back home again. Um, but I'm here by meeting Brenda, and I met her on the internet of all places, you know, and, and what, about 12 years ago. Well, 12 years ago when I first met her face to face. And, and we've been hooking up all over the country, wherever she happens to go to. Um, and, and that's what I get to do today. I get to travel. I get to go meet people that I, that, and you know, everybody I meet is an Alcoholics Anonymous, and then there are people outside of Alcoholics Anonymous, but I've met them because of people that I've met inside of Alcoholics Anonymous, and some friends in North Carolina that have nothing to do with AA. But I still get to visit them today, and I don't have to get drunk. To go and do that. I get to live life successfully. I found out that this wasn't about drinking. This really was not about drinking. Drinking alcohol was only a symptom of my problem. My problem was my inability to live life successfully. I thought I was living life successfully. I was having a good time, and I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna be one that stands up here and tells you I had bad times because I had some damn good drunk times. 
But you know, I've had some damn good sober times too, you know, and, and, and for me today, being able to stand here and do this without drinking is kind of amazing. <laughs> <laughs> to be to be able to do this and, and, and I you know, I didn't particularly want to do this. This wasn't what I came to this meeting for, I'll tell you what. Um, one of the reasons I'm standing up here is because I, the first lady that I, I worked with told me that whenever I spoke, I had to stand up, and I asked her why, and she told me it's harder to lie when you're standing up. <laughs> she also told me it was harder to lie when you're naked, but I left my clothes on tonight, <laughs> and boy, are you guys fortunate. <laughs> Thank you all for allowing me to share a little bit of my experience. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.